Good morning. Uh, so looks like you know it's a it's a huge storm out there. So hopefully that's uh, that's not bad news. Uh, all right. Well, my name's Julian. Uh, I work for uh, AWS. I'm based in the Paris office, uh, and uh, I'm a technical evangelist, which means uh, I spend a lot of time on trains, planes, taxis, especially here, uh, to come and see you guys. Uh, and, and talk about uh, cool use cases and, and technology. Uh, so today I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk about something that is uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty new, uh, although you know, it's been around for maybe a year or so, but it's probably something you hear a lot about. It's called serverless. And so I'm going to show you a few slides just to give you a little background about it. And, uh, and then we'll jump into a demo. And actually, I will need all of you for the demo. So uh, make sure you have uh, Wi-Fi or, or your phone ready to connect to the internet, OK? Because we're going to, lo to do some load testing at the end. And it never crashed so far. So let's see if Istanbul can actually crash my demo. Um, anybody has seen that slide before or that uh, sentence before? No server is easier to manage than no server. So whoops, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I can't translate that to Turkish, I'm sorry, but what it means is that uh, the easiest server to manage is actually when you have no servers, right? Uh, yeah, makes sense, right? Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that gentleman, Werner Vogels, is the CTO of Amazon, and uh, you know, God knows he has a few servers to, to worry about. Um, who is actually running ops here? I mean, who, who's, uh, who's actually in charge of servers and data centers and working on nights and weekends and uh, being on duty, et cetera. All right, a few people, all right. So you guys know what, I, what I'm talking about, right? Waking up in the middle of the night because that, uh, that MongoDB server is down or because the, yeah, you know what I mean, right? Not, well, they all go down. I'm, I'm not picking on MongoDB specifically. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's a fun sentence. It kind of makes sense, but uh, what is serverless? Uh, so serverless, is getting rid of servers, getting rid, and in the case of uh, cloud infrastructure, it means getting rid of uh, EC2 instances, getting rid of uh, virtual machines. And so what we call serverless architectures is a combination of managed services, and uh, if people in the room are using AWS, uh, you probably use managed services like uh, S3 for storage or RDS for uh, relational databases, maybe DynamoDB for NoSQL. And so it's a combination of services where uh, the, the, there is no system administration to perform because there are no servers that you are in charge of. AWS is in charge of, that, of those servers. So it's a combination of those services and a technology you may have heard about called Lambda. So I know we have some Lambda users in the room, but uh, who, who has heard of Lambda? All right. So, so yeah, it's getting popular. And who has actually tried Lambda? And, or, all right. Number of people, too. Thank you. So before I, I go into the, the actual details, uh, let's take a quick look at what Lambda is, because uh, a number of people in the room have not heard about it. So. Uh, if I had to do a very quick history of servers, uh, like the previous gentleman did in his excellent presentation, uh, we would go from physical servers to virtual machines, to containers, to uh, oh, oh, virtual machines to platform as a service, right? I'm sure you guys are using uh, uh, Heroku or uh, maybe Elastic Beanstalk in AWS. I mean, there are a number of, uh, of uh, past platforms out there. And uh, so containers are more recent, and, but containers are still a problem because you still need to worry about a lot of things, right? Uh, even if you want to deploy a small application in a container, you still need to build the image and manage it and update it and patch it. And so the next step is getting rid of everything except the actual application code. And this is what Lambda is about. So there is no fancy name for it. If you want to call it code as a service or function as a service or something else, uh, you're welcome to do it, because there is no real name for it. So the idea here, as I will show you, is to only worry and deploy 
the, the, the piece of code that is actually implementing your application. So you will deploy either Java code or Python code or Node.js code. Possibly will support more environments at a later stage. And that's it. So you're not even worrying about deploying the, uh, the, the let's say, the Java environment. Uh, you're, you're not even less worrying about managing Linux servers or, or, or something else. You're just deploying your code, right? Um, the, the, the good thing about it, uh, Lambda is that um, it, it fits really well. It integrates really well with other managed services, as I will show you in the demo. It's really easy to get events coming from S3 or other places, proce process them, and push some data or some events somewhere else. So it's like you know Lego infrastructure, if you want. I, I like to call it like that. It's really very, very little code to write. And it's more about configuration than actually writing code. So you can mainly do two things here. You can, as I just mentioned, you can build event-driven application. So for example, imagine you have an image processing app, and your users are uploading images to S3. You could trigger a Lambda function automatically to resize or change the color of the images and put them somewhere else. The only thing you would do is, is write the actual tiny piece of code that does that. You would not deploy a full application. So for even driven applications, it's really good. Another popular use case is uh, building APIs. And God knows we're writing a lot of APIs for mobile backends or you know, even web apps. Uh, and you can, as I will show you, easily combine API, the API gateway in AWS with Lambda functions to build uh, serverless backends very easily. Um, how much does it cost? That's always a good question, right? Uh, well, actually, it's another benefit of Lambda that it only costs you money when it's being used, right? Unlike, uh, let's say, virtual machine EC2 instances that cost you money as soon as you start them up, even if they really do nothing useful, for Lambda, you pay per invocation. Uh, so if your functions are called, then you pay a tiny amount. Uh, if they're not used at all, if you have no traffic, you, you don't pay anything. Okay? And, and the cost is calculated by 100 millisecond slots. So that's really nice too, because if you have a, a piece of code that runs in, let's say, 120 milliseconds, you will pay for two slots. And if you can optimize it and make it run in, let's say, 95 milliseconds, then it's only one slot. And that means the cost of this function was divided by two. So finally, developers have a really, really strong incentive to write efficient code, right? Of course, they were already doing that, but just in case. All right, so this is what Lambda is about. You know, getting rid of servers, deploying tiny pieces of code that either react to events or are invoked by APIs, okay? So there's another way to put it, to make it simpler. Uh, there was a, ser a serverless conference uh, in New York a few days ago. And uh, this is the, what the general manager of Lambda did. So let's watch that again. Right, so serverless. Right, OK. Sounds like a fun boss to have. But hopefully, he's not bringing that baseball bat to, to work every day. Um, so here's an example of uh, a customer application. Uh, it's, a, it's a company called, uh, whoops, sorry about that. It's a company called AdRoll. Um, it's, uh, it's an ad tech company in the US. And uh, so basically what they do is uh, they, they buy a lot of, uh, uh, of online space to display banners, right? So they do it using a technology called real-time bidding. You may have heard about that. So it's, it, what it means really is that you go, every time a user goes to a website that is connected to, uh, to AdRoll, uh, every single, yeah, it's the end of the world out there. All right. Should be fun for my flight back. Hopefully it doesn't last. Uh, every time uh, they get a chance to buy space for a user uh, on a web page, yeah, sounds fun, uh, they will do that in real time, right? So every single banner is, is purchased in real time, so they get called by the ad exchange, they bid with a price, and if they win, they send the, they send the banner back to, that, uh, to the website to, to be displayed. 
Okay, and uh, so real-time bidding in a nutshell. And uh, they do that uh, 40 billion, oh, sorry, 60 billion times every day. So it's a lot of events, it's a lot of traffic. So they have a, a bidding infrastructure in, in multiple regions in AWS, and all of that stuff goes into Lambda, right? And so they have Lambda functions to uh, process those billions of events and, uh, and uh, store data into DynamoDB and other places. So Lambda is really, uh, can you still hear me? <laughs> wow, all right. Um, so Lambda is, is really, uh, it's not a toy, that's what I mean. Uh, it's not a toy, it's really in production. We have many, many customer references. Uh, if you have questions on that later on, feel free to ask, okay? All right, so this is what we're going to do today. And uh, actually it's, uh, it's kind of a typical problem um, to solve, right? What we, something's wrong here, sorry. Uh, what we're trying to do here is um, we're trying to build an API that is going to be invoked uh, with some data. So we will use some dummy data for, for the, the demo. And that we want that data to be logged in real time to a system that makes it available for, let's say, web applications, right? So when I say real time, you know, I mean really, really fast. So let's say well under a second, right? I want the data to be logged to a, to a back end. In my case, I will use DynamoDB. But I also want that data to keep following the pipeline, and uh, I want the data to end up in another uh, storage system where I could run, uh, let's say, MapReduce jobs, or I would do analytics. I would do batch processing on it, okay? So it's fairly typical to do that. And uh, so usually, what would you do? I mean, with normal systems, uh, so you would, you would have your web app running on a web server, and you would log to syslog or, or log files. I mean, you know, Apache or Nginx or whatever, okay? So you would log to files. And of course, you could move those files to your filer for batch processing, etc. But if you want real-time processing as well, you know, it's, it's slightly more complicated. So I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying, you know, all of a sudden, it becomes a huge project to take that data and put it both in a real-time system for analytics and in a batch processing system for machine learning or something like that, right? So what we're going to do here so we're going to go through all, all those steps. I'm going to show you real quick how to do that with some examples, and then we'll run the demo. OK, so we'll go first. So my API is public. It's on the, on the internet. Um, it's exposed by the uh, API gateway. That plugs into a Lambda function, and the Lambda function writes to Kinesis. Kinesis is a messaging system, highly scalable, very good for real time uh, in AWS. And then I've got the second Lambda function listening at the other end of Kinesis to pick up the messages, write them to DynamoDB. So that's, that's the very fast part of the, that's the, let's say the real time part of the pipeline. And then when stuff is written in DynamoDB, that's going to trigger a third Lambda function, right? It's like a SQL trigger, it's a similar mechanism. And that Lambda function will pick up the updated lines, the new lines, and write them into Kinesis again uh, a variant of Kinesis called Firehose, which is very simple, as you will see. And at the end of Firehose, I have S3, where I will see my files being delivered, containing all the events and all the data, okay? So you can start thinking about how many lines of code I need to do that, and how many actual servers I need to do that, okay? So let me show you, of course I'm gonna show you the, the AWS console and how to do that, but I wanna stress one point, is that of course, you can automate all that stuff, and uh, specifically, you can, everything I'm, I'm showing you here, you can create using the AWS API from the command line or from uh, 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 one of our SDKs, uh, Java, PHP, .NET, uh, Ruby, whatever. So for example, this is how you would create the DynamoDB table, okay? So I'm not gonna go through all the parameters, it's, uh, it's not really important today, but in one line, I'm adding a new table into DynamoDB. Uh, I'm creating, I'm defining what the sharding key is. 
uh, I'm defining what the, what the capacity is, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So that, that's just one line. That's all you need to do. Uh, this is how I would create a Lambda function. Uh, so I have the, 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 the code in the zip file that is mentioned on the command line. And I'm just creating the function with a name, the zip file containing the, the, the code. Uh, and that's it, right? And then with the second call, I'm connecting that Lambda function as a trigger uh, into DynamoDB. So as you can see, you know, it's, a lot of it is about configuration. This is not code. This, this is just connecting pieces of infrastructure with pretty simple calls. Okay? Uh, this is how you would create the, the Firehose uh, stream. Okay? Again, this is pretty simple. Uh, you're giving it a name, pointing it to S3. Uh, you're saying that you want data to be compressed with a gzip, and you're saying you don't want data to be encrypted, blah, blah, blah. Right? One call, that's all it takes to connect, uh, to, connect the, to create the Firehose stream. Right? So I could show you all the calls for all the pieces of the, of the, of the pipeline, but you, know, you get the idea, right? You can very easily automate it. You can build scripts. You can build code that creates all that stuff. Uh, and, uh, and you can automate everything, right? So let's look at the real thing. Can you still read in the back or? Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so that's the first part. That's the uh, API gateway, okay? Um, so what I'm doing here really is I'm creating, so these are uh, RESTful APIs. So we're going to create resources and methods. So I created a, a logger uh, resource and I defined a post method on that, on that uh, resource. And so what I'm doing here, really, is I'm posting data to the API. And what that means is I'm really posting it to a Lambda function because I integrated a Lambda function with the, with the API on, on post, right? And you can see that function here, write to Kinesis, okay? So here I'm keeping it really simple, but with the API gateway, you could do authorization, you could have tokens, you could do encryption. You know, it can get as complex as you need it to be here, you know, it's a, it's a very simple API that just takes the, the, the post parameters and, and uh, passes them to the Lambda function, right? So this is the one you guys are gonna call in five minutes, maybe 10, okay? So here's the first Lambda function. Okay, so I'm using Python because, you know, why not? Uh, and I, you know, you, you don't want me to code in Node.js anyway. That would be a disaster. Uh, so Python is, I can, do, I can still do Python. Uh, so what do we see here? Uh, so this is the code being displayed in the console, and typically this is where people scream, what, you want me to code in the AWS console? No way, I'm never gonna do that. So of course you don't have to do that, right? Uh, as I showed you, you can code into your environment and then zip the code and upload it to AWS, but you can also see it, and if you want, edit it in the AWS console, but you know, I'm not recommending that, okay? So I'm importing the Boto3 is the, uh, the weird name of the uh, Python SDK for AWS. I'm importing JSON because as you know, pretty much everything in AWS is based on JSON. And here's the actual function, so. The function gets the event, so the event will be a JSON document containing uh, parameters, so in that case, the, 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 the data that is being passed to the API uh, what, that I'm posting on. Okay, I'm just, I'm adding a timestamp to that document, okay, because again, why not? And then, uh, I'm getting access to uh, my Kinesis stream, Okay, and I'm putting a record in there, right? So I'm just writing that JSON document into the Kinesis stream, okay? How many lines of code is that? One, okay, that one doesn't count. This one is just me being clever, and this one is actually useful. Okay, so two lines, okay? So once again, that's it. 
right? This is your API. If you were doing that the old way, whatever the language, whatever the environment, how would you do it? You would start a virtual machine, you would deploy PHP or um, something else, Ruby, whatever. You would write the code for the API. That would be probably a little longer than that. Uh, and you would have to manage all that stuff, right? So you, you would have to manage a server, an, a, an execution environment, and an application just for those two lines of code that are useful to you, okay? Here, the only thing you do is write, the, write those two lines, click save, and that's it, right? Okay, so here's my Kinesis stream. So there's nothing really fancy to show you here because the stream is really just a name, right? The number of shards is how many, because uh, messages will be sharded. That's how we scale Kinesis. Uh, so we could have multiple shards in there. Uh, I just need one for now. And that's all it does. So it's a message queue if you want. But messages are persisted for uh, seven days. And as I've said, it's super, super scalable, right? Anyone plays uh, Clash of Clans, Boom Beach, etc.? And the other ones, yes? You, you have time to do that? All right, I, I thought you were a serious guy. <laughs> All right. But your English is so much better than my Turkish, I can't make fun of you. <laughs> uh, so if you play those games by, uh, uh, you know they're, uh, uh, they're uh, designed by a company called Supercell. Supercell is a large AWS customer. And actually all the events that are sent back uh, by the games to their platform go through Kinesis. And they have, uh, as you know, a few months ago, they announced they had 100 million players daily. 100 million, that's, that's a huge number. And uh, they, they generate about 45 billion events every day. Right, so if you're worried about the scalability of Kinesis, don't, right, don't be afraid. It, it scales pretty well, right? Okay, so that's for that. And then at the, uh, at the end of that stream, I've got a second function, still Python. And what does that one do? Well, it's going, basically, it's going to read events from the Kinesis stream, and it's going to write them into DynamoDB. So here, to be more efficient, I'm batching the events, right? I'm reading those events uh, 10 by 10, I believe. Um, um, because you know, it's a bit of a waste to say every time an event is written, I'm going to read it and write it to DynamoDB, right? It's maybe more efficient to piggyback, to you know, put those uh, events together and write them in a single batch to DynamoDB. But okay, you could, you could do it in a different way. So I'm getting access to my DynamoDB table called event table, and literally I'm iterating over each single event and writing them to DynamoDB, right? And I have to do a little JSON conversion here, but you know, don't worry about that, okay? The, the really important one is that one, okay? Table, put item, that's how you write in DynamoDB. It's a NoSQL database, so you only need to know how to do get and put, and that's it. Very simple, very easy to do. So how many lines of code is that? All right, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, all right, six, all right, let's say eight, right? Eight lines. So two lines for the first functions, for, uh, for function, eight for that one. Okay? Let's continue. So the DynamoDB table showed you how to create it. Uh, nothing much to show you. When you create a table, you can provision some read capacity and write capacity. That's important because it, it, it determines performance and cost, right? So that's why it's probably a good idea to piggyback all the, all the writes. Um, because you can maybe write a little less often to the database and, uh, and maybe save, save some money here. All right, and I would see the, the items here. All right, so I'm writing a user ID, my, tab, my timestamp, and some bogus data just to create some, <laughs> some volume here, right? That's what in my table, right? Nothing fancy here. And so, as I mentioned, every time something is written to my uh, table, a trigger executes and invokes a third lambda function. That's the one. And that one gets uh, access to firehose. And again, it's going to iterate over the records and call firehose put record, sending the updated event into firehose. Right? 
same ID, how many lines? One, two, three, four, five, right? So 15 lines so far of Python. Finally, I'm writing into my Kinesis, my Firehose stream. So Firehose is, is, uh, is built on top of Kinesis. It's very simple. You don't even manage shards. It will scale automatically. The only thing you, you mention here is, do you want to compress data? Do you want to encrypt it? And how often do you want to flush Firehose into the destination, which is, which is S3 here? So I want to flush it every 60 seconds or every time I've got one megabyte of data, right? These are uh, configurable, okay? So in our case, unless you guys can really click or load test heavily, I assume it will be every 60 seconds, okay? And that's all you need to set. And finally, um, I will, that's S3, uh, that's my bucket here, and I should see, that that's the test I did earlier today, uh, I should see my files uh, showing up, right? Just trying to go back, yeah, that's it, okay. Okay, so we should see one file every minute with, with the data showing up, okay? That's it, so it's time to test, right? Before we go into the demo and go crazy and, and, and any questions? Because you guys will get excited after and you will forget all the questions. Any question on Lambda, serverless, or anything? Yeah, you just want, you just want to test, right? Oh, yes, please. Uh, how does the error handling process of Lambda, I mean, what? Do we get any kind of uh, event if there is a timeout? OK, so the question is, how do you do error handling in Lambda? Um, so lambda, uh, wh every time you create a lambda function, um, a, a log, a new log is created automatically in CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is the monitoring system for AWS, and there's a part in there called CloudWatch Logs, which is about logs, right? That's, so that's an appropriate name, I suppose. Um, and so anything that happens in the lambda function will be logged in there. So when you see in the, in the Lambda code, when you see print, whatever, this is actually printing to the log, right? Not to the console, because there is no console. <laughs> There's no server, right? So it, it all gets logged. Uh, so you can very easily inspect the logs and, and, and see what's happening there. You could do that visually. You could do that automatically. You can, you can fetch the logs with, an, uh, with the API and inspect them. Uh, and if there's a timeout, that's, you would clearly see uh, that. Um, in the logs and in the CloudWatch metrics for, for the Lambda function, you can al always see the timeouts as well. So you could have an alarm saying, if I, ha if I have more than X timeouts, send an alert to whatever, right? And that alert could trigger something else, could send an SMS, could send email, could send, uh, maybe could call another, it could call another Lambda function, <laughs> right? So there are a number of ways to do it, okay? Yes. How can we handle automated tests? Uh, okay, so that's a really good question. Uh, that's the, usually people complain about coding in the console and then they say, yeah, and that way obviously I cannot test. Uh, so um, it depends on the, on the technology that you're using. Uh, if you're using Java, for example, there's an Eclipse plugin that is available, uh, that is uh, available from, from us, uh, where uh, you, can, you can perform, you can execute your Lambda functions locally, you can do JUnit uh, testing on it, and that, that works reasonably well. Um, if you use uh, Node.js, uh, you can use something called the serverless framework, I'll mention it at the end, which also allows you to run your Lambda functions locally, so, uh, and for Python, something else, so there's no single tool to do it, right? And we don't integrate that into Lambda, but there are many open source that are being built on top of Lambda to do that, okay? But it, yeah, it's a good question. The, the, the limitation here is, of course, you cannot have a local copy of DynamoDB and a local copy of S3 and a local copy of RDS on your PC. That would be super nice. Uh, 
uh, but it's not possible. So y you can do mockups, or you can have your you can have a testing environment within AWS, which is probably the best way to do it. Uh, like you would have, you know, your dev and test and uh, QA and prod uh, environments for instances. You can do the same thing for uh, you can do the same thing for Lambda, right? You can create different stages for API, etc. So I guess you can build your environments that way. But yeah, yeah, probably we need more tools. I agree. More questions? Yes. Uh, can we trigger the Lambda function from outside of the, from, uh, for example, other services? Uh, uh, not, yeah, so not AWS. Oh, okay. Um, so one, one obvious way is to use an API. Right, yeah. a public API that triggers a function like like I'm doing. Uh, I am mentioning like a, uh, can it can be a listener for uh, like a web socket. Um, I think you can do. I, I you know I'm a little late there, but uh, on, on my reading, but I think you can do web sockets now. Uh, yeah. You can do things like that. Okay, but thank uh, you. AP, from the external world, probably APIs are just the best way. The more secure, etc., because you can, you know, uh, if it's being, if it's coming from the outside world, you want to make sure you have authorization, you have a token, you have something, and you can do that in the API gateway. Uh, do you have any plans to increase the uh, code deployment package size limits? Uh, Yes, so the, the problem here is uh, the, a Lambda function has a maximum size. Uh, I, do you remember the size? <laughs> I think I forgot. 50 megabytes as a zip file. 50? Megabytes as a zip that file. That much? Okay, I thought it was less than that. Are you sure? Okay. So uh, that, that's, obviously if you're going to do, let's say, Python, that sounds huge. But if you, let's say, if you use Java and you want to embed your own libraries in the jar file, in the zip file that you're uploading, you know, it could be a problem. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not sure about that. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But, uh, you know, you, you can always ask. You know, you can always ask. Uh, and uh, if there's a strong case to do it, fine. But I think the philosophy of Lambda is to keep it pretty short. You know, there's an execution timeout of uh, five minutes. Uh, so it's not a lambda function is not supposed to run for hours and hours. So it shouldn't be a huge thing. Okay. More questions? Actually, I have a question. All right. You, are you allowed to ask questions? All right. Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, I saw some open source projects uh, to support uh, CI CD needs uh, for lambda functions. Uh, its names should be Lambda CI, CD. Yeah. Uh, is there any, another option that uh, directly supported yeah, by? Yeah, literally, I mean, literally every week on GitHub, there's a new project to do that. Uh, the, the, the initial one was called uh, JAWS, which stands for uh, Just AWS Without Servers. That's a, that's a glorious name. They renamed it to Serverless. I'm going to give you the, the reference later. Uh, there's another one called Apex. There's another one called Gordon. Um, I mean, if you follow Hacker News, I mean, literally every week you're going to see a new project. So, my advice is, you know, try them out and uh, and let us know how they work. You know, I I wish I had the time to try them all, but uh, write, you know, blog about them and tw uh, tweet about them and uh, and uh, and maybe contribute to them. Because definitely, yes, we need, we need more tools. So there, it's, it's moving really fast. Thanks. Uh, hello. Uh, can you reuse some variables between uh, different Lambda executions? Uh, no. Uh, so Lambda functions are completely stateless. OK, so from one execution to the next, uh, there's, no, there's no state. That's why they are called pure functions. There is no state. So if you need state, it needs to be outside of, of Lambda. And typically, you would put that in DynamoDB. If you had some session information or whatever, you would store it uh, in DynamoDB. But you can't store anything uh, locally in a Lambda function. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Oh, there's one down there. Uh, can we chain those lambda functions? Uh, one lambda function uh, yes. logically selects some other lambda yes. functions to run again. Uh, so absolutely. Um, so inside the lambda function, you can use the, S the, the AWS SDK, uh, and uh, part of that is uh, invoking other functions. So yeah, definitely you could chain functions like that. Yes. Which is, I think, good practice because you want to keep them really short. So you want to split your processing into multiple parts that are easier to deploy, easier to version, easier to manage, and uh, and chain them. Sure, and you can have versions and al aliases, etc. So yeah. Okay. Uh, while using Lambda, sometimes uh, if you want to share the code between some teams, let's say, uh, you also need the kind of configuration parameters there. So let's say if you use some credentials or yeah, if sure. you use some different endpoints, but what's the best way to pass these configuration parameters to Lambda functions? Um, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, okay, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay, need to check, right. But we can talk about that later. Uh, you know, my, my, uh, my easy answer to that would be uh, um, it, sorry? Copy no. <laughs> That's my silly answer. So no copy paste. Um, again, you know, I, I would I would put that in uh, I would put that in DynamoDB, but it, you know it it, bec it can become a chicken egg and, and uh, a chicken and egg problem. Uh, and um, okay, we can talk about that later. We, I, we can take a look. All right, demo. Okay. So I just need to. So I've got a. a you know, I, I have a, an EC2 instance running here, but it's just for uh, just to host a small web app that is uh, that is calling the the API. Okay. So let me start it. Okay, it should be ready. Let me check. Yes, okay. So this is where you want to go. All right. Let's go. <laughs> It's okay to do some scripting if you want. I mean, you can try and crash it. That's that's good. All right. So, let's see if we are uh... Okay, we see some traffic. Oh, you want the URL again? All right, sorry. So usually this is going to crash the conference Wi-Fi, so I, I apologize in advance if that happens. Okay. okay, everybody has it? Okay, so what are you doing here? Uh, do, do you see the lolcats? Yes? <laughs> you should. All right. So this is serving a lot of lolcats, right? Uh, I, I wish this was an AWS service, but it's not. It's called the cat API. Uh, it's easy to find if you need a never-ending stream of lolcats. So when you're loading that page, you're calling my API, right? Defining the API gateway, and you're passing that random data that is displayed on the page. It's just to create some some volume here, okay? And then the data follows, you know, from uh, from API gateway to Lambda, right to Kinesis, and then returns. So from a client point of view, this is a really fast call because the call returns before the data is even pushed to the, to the database, which is good practice, right? So even if DynamoDB was shut down, this would still be very fast, okay? Because I'm just writing into Kinesis, right? You want another one? All right, all right, this is really fast. Okay, and then it gets written into DynamoDB and, and the Lambda function gets triggered, writes into Firehose, and every 60 seconds, write to S3. Right, so it should be 60 seconds now, so let's look at S3 here. All 
All right. So yeah. So it's maybe a little small, but yeah, you can see the time here. Okay. So you see, pretty much, we have one file every minute, right? But if you were clicking quicker <laughs> or reloading the page quicker, you know, we would see one megabyte files deliver uh, more often than once every 60 seconds. Okay, and uh, do you want to look at one of those? The answer is yes. Ooh. That's a funny place to open the pop-up, yeah. So did I do something stupid or? Okay. All right, you're still going. Good. But well, we have some scripts running, I can tell. Um, so that's the more recent one, yeah. Okay, so Jason Lovers, this one's for you. Uh, so what you see here, uh, of course, it's not supposed to be processed by humans. It's supposed to be processed by MapReduce jobs written by non-humans, right? Uh, so what you see here is uh, uh, the, 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 tri the result of the trigger. So you see the actual line that has been written into DynamoDB uh, with all the fields, the timestamps, user ID, etc. So that's, that's quite a lot, okay? So yeah, you're real. Not crashing, not crashing, good. And so if we reload S3 again, we should see more files, right? They keep coming. So how many lines of code did we write? 15, <laughs> plus a couple of CLI calls. I'll, I'll give you that, but 15 lines of code. How many servers are we managing? How many servers, how many virtual machines are going to wake you up at night? <laughs> Zero, right? So that's cool. So something else will wake you up at night, right? Especially if you have kids. But uh, that's a different problem, right? Different problem to manage. You can't ch shut them down, okay? So next question. Um, so probably here we have, let's say, uh, let's say 10 hits per second, or maybe 50 hits per second, right? If we had one million hits per second, what would change? What would you need to scale? <coughs> right, I'll show you the picture again. What would you need to scale if you had one million hits per second? Not much, huh? Which one? <laughs> all the servers, yeah. You would have to scale all the servers. Excellent point. <laughs> so you would not need to scale anything, right? Uh, you would need to maybe add more shards to Kinesis to make it you know, more scalable. You probably would need to raise a few service limits. If you're using AWS, you know we have limits for many services. But they're here to protect you from doing silly things. And if you want to raise limits, raise the number of lambdas that can run in parallel, et cetera, you can just create a ticket and it gets, uh, it gets changed really quick by AWS support. So a little bit of configuration, but no need to change the code and no need to change the infrastructure, right? If you have no traffic, how much would that cost? Lambda, zero. API gateway, maybe a fraction of something because you have an API defined. Uh, you would pay for a little bit, probably DynamoDB would be the, m the more expensive if you have a lot of data already sitting in DynamoDB, but uh, you would not pay for any extra data if you're not writing. S3, you would pay for storage, three cents per gigabyte per month. So that's not so much. So it's, it's probably very cost effective too, right? So six, 15, 16 lines, no servers, very scalable, Good performance, pretty cost effective, okay? 
So if you want to learn more about Lambda, one of my colleagues, uh, maybe you've seen him, he, I know he's been in, uh, in Istanbul a few times, uh, Danilo, uh, he's, he's writing a book currently on AWS Lambda, uh, and uh, the book is not complete yet, but you can, you can buy it and uh, get the, the new chapters as they become available. Actually, the chapter seven became available this morning. <laughs> so it's about halfway done. Uh, it's an excellent book written by uh, one of the best experts on the subject. So if you can afford it, you know, I would definitely recommend it. If you want to go further, of course, there's lots of documentation on Lambda on our website. There's a, a blog for compute technologies, including Lambda. We have a user group in Turkey, uh, which I had the pleasure, pleasure to attend a couple of months ago. It's on, uh, on meetup.com, so if you're interested in AWS, strongly suggest that you join those guys. Uh, if you want to uh, try and, and, and learn about uh, AWS technology, uh, there's a platform called Quick Labs to do online uh, training. Uh, it's not free, but it's not very expensive, and they've just announced some new labs for Lambda. So if you want to try quickly without having an AWS account, it's a good way to learn. And the serverless framework that I mentioned, so it's not an AWS uh, uh, product, but uh, I think uh, you know, they get support from us, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting way to, do some, uh, to extend the, the management of your Lambda functions. All right, that's the end of my talk. I want to thank you very much. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but I really, really thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, to, to the, the conference for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm definitely looking forward to the taxi ride back to the airport. Uh, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.